Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to War in the Pacific, Admiral's Edition, with our play-by-email game against XTRG. It is January 10th, 1942, and this should be an interesting turn as our heavy cruisers are attempting to escape from the Japanese uh, carrier battle group, uh, following a engagement which was very favorable to us against a Japanese battle fleet uh, just east of Comac. Uh, and the island of New Caledonia, where the Japanese are trying to land and take over. This should be an interesting turn, uh, not just because of that, but a few other things that are in motion. Um, although I'm not sure how much we'll see in the actual combat results here. Ugh. Japanese uh, torpedoes just hit a tanker off the coast of the Dutch East Indies. I don't think we've lost a tanker yet, but that's... Uh, uh, I didn't hear bubbling, so that's a good sound. Hopefully she can make it back to port. That's a little bit concerning, though. Uh, those things are like gold. Even to the Allies, we don't have enough tankers early in the war. Meanwhile, off the coast of Fiji, uh, we can see here the cargo ship Chattanooga City taking a few torpedoes from the Japanese uh, as well. Um, that's not great, but at least it's only a cargo ship. We have plenty and plenty of them. Um, this episode's a little bit different. The last few episodes, I have been doing live streams and kind of sharing the results there. Honestly, guys, I wanted to live stream uh, last night. Uh, you're watching this on uh, Wednesday morning. I wanted to live stream Tuesday night. I got a copy of uh, Rule the Waves 2, which is coming out Friday. Uh, but frankly, I came down with a migraine and kind of had to settle for doing something quick, a little bit abbreviated, uh, so I could get something out and also just kind of continue this on, because I know XTRG's itching for the, for the turn. Um, but I also, uh, do plan to live stream tonight, that being Wednesday night, probably around 10 o'clock Central Standard Time, Rule the Waves 2 on my Twitch channel. I'll throw a link in the description. Uh, it's the sequel to Rule the Waves 1. What a shocker. Um, and uh, I'm pretty excited for it. Tortuga was actually live streaming it last night. and um, or, or Sorry, yesterday afternoon. And um, he had like 225 people watching. Granted, it was on YouTube where I feel like it's a lot easier for like war games to get a lot of viewers on streaming on YouTube. I prefer to mix things up and do a little bit of Twitch uh, for streaming and then my videos on demand on YouTube. Uh, but it was, uh, uh, you know, it was exciting to see all that excitement around this game. This game comes out Friday. Rule of Waves 2 comes out Friday. There is a demo available on Naval Warfare Sims' uh, website right now for everybody. And then you can buy it on Friday. But uh, a couple of us have the actual uh, release candidate version of Rule the Waves 2. Uh, so like Tortuga was playing the full version of the game and I'll be playing the full version of the game. Again, 10 o'clock Central Standard Time, Wednesday night. Uh, you can see here we're doing some depth charging against Japanese submarines here just off of Midway where our battleships are located. Uh, and nothing going there, so that's fine. Meanwhile, our submarines are continuing to fire their torpedoes at submarine chasers rather than merchant ships. That's frustrating. It's inviting destruction, but fortunately the Japanese didn't respond against them. Not a ton going on. A few submarine actions, a few torpedoes fired, probably only one ship sunk, um, and now we're moving on into the air phase. Um, so one other thing to remember is those cruisers of ours that are running away, uh, they had been in the middle of a thunderstorm, so hopefully if the Japanese, and I know we were in range of the Kiru Butai, uh, at the start of this turn, um, but if the Japanese are chasing us, uh, at the very least, uh, it, it could be good news that the weather's poor. It's already at very long range. They were, they were far enough away that the Japanese couldn't use torpedoes against us. They'd have to use bombs. But if you throw 200 bombers out against cruisers, even if they're armed with dive bombs instead of torpedoes, that's still probably bad for us. Meanwhile, he started bombing against uh, the garrison at Bataan. As you may recall, a couple of turns ago, we got pushed out of Clark Field and have been pushed back to Bataan uh, on the uh, peninsula in Luzon in the Philippines. Uh, so he'll probably begin sort of operations to reduce our forces or effectiveness there. We have quite a bit of supply though, so we should be able to hang out there for quite a while. Um, once we get to level 10 fortifications, I think what I'm going to do, sorry, level 4 fortifications, we'll probably stop building forts and just focus on conserving supply, because I don't even, I mean, if I was him, I would attack my troops there. <laughs> Uh, because you really need to free up Japanese troops early, but there is a valid Japanese strategy uh, of just kind of letting them sit there and not attacking them, and uh, using minimal forces to bottle them up, and then letting them starve with supply, and then a couple of months later you move in and finish them off. 
Um, so it'll be interesting to see what strategy he follows. Um, okay, so the AM phases go off without much going on. Dauntlesses are spotting some things in the water from our carriers. Airstrikes are moving in and uh, occurring here. Not a lot of air activity either. This has been a pretty quiet turn, which for us is, go is a good thing. Uh, we don't want an active turn after the last battle. I'm hoping that we mission killed his surface task force, by the way. Those two battleships, at least one of them, suffered a fair bit of damage. Uh, probably all of those warships are out of ammunition. Uh, so the hope would be that uh, if they're out of ammo, they're going to have to return to truck to rearm. And then, you know, some of the cruisers and battleships might be out of action for a month or two. Maybe more, but probably at least a month, I would guess. Meanwhile, our carrier air raid against Midway is continuing. Uh, it doesn't appear the Japanese have any aircraft on Midway, which suits me just fine. Gives my crews some chances to launch some attacks and gain some experience there. Um, while my other carriers withdraw from the Tarawa raid uh, back into Pearl Harbor. Uh, a lot of recon over the uh, Malay Peninsula. Aircraft landing, transport, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I think that's gonna do it, I guess. Some ship just sank. We just heard something happen. Uh, meanwhile, temporary re flotation repairs are failing on the Pennsylvania. Uh, the Japanese are bombarding our troops at Kaigan. I think we actually had, uh, uh, a direct assault order, or a deliberate assault order there. Uh, you can see our coastal guns are firing in support, but we're losing quite a few disabled casualties from those heavy cruisers. It does look like they're landing reinforcements there, so we may have to stop the attack there. Uh, and just focus on hanging out and defending as long as we can. Um, oh boy. Japanese deliberate attack at Lo Yang. This is where the bulk of our northern force in China is located. We have two strong armies in the north. One at Nanyang here a little bit further to the west. And one here at Lo Yang to the north. Unfortunately, these are in clear terrain. As much as the map makes it look like it's mountainous terrain, they're in clear tiles. Now, the benefit is they do have level 3 fortifications here, uh, but the Japanese have a huge force attacking with a lot of armor, which is something the Chinese really struggle to fight against. I was debating falling back on Cyan anyway and taking defensive positions in these mountainous areas over here um, because those will probably equal, if not exceed, the defensive benefits of having like a level 3 fort in a city that is considered a clear hex. These aren't urban hexes. These cities aren't large enough to be considered urban in the way that uh, Changsha or uh, Chongqing are. The little circle around the, the flag there indicates that they're major urban centers, whereas you can see these flags don't have the circle, which indicates they're not major urban centers. Um, lots of bombardment going on, and we're going to fast forward through this battle. We'll see what happens here. You can see here at least three, four Japanese divisions. They've got the 36th, 37th, 41st, 29th infantry divisions. They've got the 23rd tank regiment, the 9th, the 5th, the 3rd tank regiments, the 20th recon regiment, the 12th tank regiment, the 15th tank regiment, uh, and then a whole bunch of artillery. We have a bunch of Chinese corps, but that's not necessarily sufficient. You can see here the Japanese actually had greater adjusted assault value despite the level 3 fortifications. Their engineers immediately reduced the fortifications from level 3 down to level 2, uh, which prevented it from having a good defensive bonus on our end. It ended up being 1 to 1. You can see here the Japanese lost 6,643 casualties, 20 squads destroyed. That's quite a lot. 673 squads disabled. That is a butt ton. Uh, 9 combatant, non combatant squads destroyed. Sorry, 8. Uh, and 69 disabled. Two engineers dis destroyed, 35 disabled, uh, 53 guns lost, but only two of those are destroyed. 112 vehicles lost, 21 of those are destroyed. That's actually quite a few vehicles destroyed. But we lost nearly two times their casualties, 12,325 casualties on the Chinese end, 312 infantry squads destroyed, 463 disabled. So between the two, we lost about 775 squads. 312 of them permanently. He lost about 693 squads. The total number of squads that are out of action next turn actually isn't that much of a discrepancy. 775 to us, 693 to him. I would love those numbers if it wasn't for the fact that 300 of those on our end are destroyed. Additionally, 45 non-combatant squads destroyed for us, 373 disabled. 
Um, 38 engineer squads destroyed for us, 72 disabled, uh, 120 guns destroyed. The gun losses, again, pretty similar. A hundred, or, well, actually, no, they're not. 120 guns lost to us, verse 53 for him. 50 of ours were, dis- were destroyed, however. Uh, the one positive there is that we didn't lose any vehicles because we had none to lose uh, versus his 21 vehicles destroyed. Uh, and we lost one unit destroyed. I'm not sure which unit. I'd have to go back in and check. You can see here he has a massive force against us. And uh, we held our ground, but only just barely. Meanwhile, just northeast of Wu Chao, he's also attacking there with the 38th Infantry Division uh, and some artillery regiments supporting against a couple of Chinese corps there. Apparently, we held our position as well. Uh, again, uh, this one's not as bad. We lost two squads destroyed. He didn't lose any. Uh, we lost two non-combatant squads destroyed. No engineers and eight guns, one destroyed. He lost 287 men versus our 372. That's not terrible. Those are pretty light losses for China. Meanwhile, an Allied deliberate attack at Kaigan against his 16th Infantry Regiment, but he also brought in the 2nd SNLF uh, Sezebo Marine Regiment, or I think those are a regiment. Maybe it's a battalion here. You can see we're attacking with two Filipino Infantry Regiments, the 3rd Filipino Constabulary Regiment, uh, some infantry battalions of the 101st Filipino B- Infantry, and then the 102nd Filipino Infantry Division. Uh, you can see there we have the advantage in terms of the attacking force. We outnumber him by just shy of 3 to 1. Uh, we outnumber his guns by more than 3 to 1. Uh, and uh, our assault value versus him is almost 4 to 1. We end up with 3 to 1 assault value. He loses 240, 240 men, but nothing destroyed. We lose 498 men, only 2 destroyed, but 96 squads disabled. So even though we had 3 to 1 odds, we actually lost more men than him uh, by more than t- more than double. So that was not a great result for us. Um, yeah. He gets a terrain advantage there, which helps. It's a jungle terrain. So we'll probably call off the offensive uh, on the island of Mindanao as well and just kind of hunker down and wait for uh, wait for his attack. The problem is we don't really have a lot of supply there, so that's that's an issue. Meanwhile, he attacks at Kuatan on the Malay Peninsula and surprisingly doesn't take it. I don't know why. It didn't do the whole bonsai thing. He did take Via Tipu, uh, just north of Funafuti, uh, which is north of the Fiji line. Uh, so that's another base for him there, but we had no troops there that uh, we needed to worry about. And uh, Pago expands the airfield to size 2. Uh, Pago is expanding fortifications to level 3. And I think that's going to do it for this turn. So we'll jump out, uh, and we will catch you guys back once I have time to uh, process the turn a little bit, look through a few things, issue my orders, and then we will uh, return uh, for a summary of what we're going to be doing, uh, and then we will uh, wrap this turn up. Uh, But thanks. uh, Well, we're not going to thank you yet. Uh, We've got a few more minutes to go. So uh, let's jump out, and then we'll jump back in in just a moment. All right, and we're back here in our turn. It is January 11th of 1942. Uh, first things first, checking in on the tanker that was torpedoed off the coast of Oosthaven. It was the Man Ventura, and she made it back to port, at least for the moment. I'm not able to repair her because firefighting operations are currently underway uh, because she has level 14 fires. But hopefully uh, she's far enough south that the fires can get put out, the flood damage can get reduced a little bit while in port based off of uh, my hopes and dreams and desires, and then maybe she can limp away to safety. Uh, Because I'd rather not lose a tanker. It's only worth 12 victory value. It's not a huge tanker. It's a Dutch tanker. But it sure would be nice to get her out of there and uh, able to uh, sort of continue assisting in our tanker operations. Meanwhile, the other ships that were in her task force are well on their way to Perth, uh, where they'll be unloading some 25,000 fuel, uh, three tankers, one destroyer escorting them. That 25,000 was pulled out of Oosthaven. Speaking of which, Oosthaven has 26,000 fuel. And we are loading five more tankers up at Oosthaven uh, four 5,000 plus or larger, and one 1,800 tanker, which is kind of not really worth its weight, but uh, nonetheless. Um, so that's about another 25,000 fuel that's being loaded up at Oosthaven that will end up being directed to Perth as well. 
Uh, in addition to that, uh, so that's, you know, you can see that'll dry out what's left in Newstaven, assuming the Newstaven doesn't pull more fuel south from Palembang, which it almost certainly will. Meanwhile, at Palembang, you can see we're up to a quarter million oil, which we're not really doing anything with, and 100,000 fuel. We're trying to reduce that fuel number as far as we can so that when he does take it, he's forced to transport the oil to refineries to get that work done. We've made quite a bit of progress there, and as you may recall, the actual refineries are turned off and are not producing anything. Repairs should also be turned off as well. Um, meanwhile, at Palembang, we did play a little bit of a risky gamble. Uh, risky gamble, isn't that a little bit... Uh uh, whatever. Um, we uh, were able to get five tankers successfully into port. It was done somewhat by accident, but those five tankers are actually valuable. That one is worth about 20. Uh, the other tankers here are worth 18, 18, uh, 18, uh, and 18. Uh, and that's basically the value of about a light, uh, an obsolete light cruiser. So they're not invaluable ships. Uh, meanwhile, we have uh, they're going to be loading up to about 41,000 fuel uh, from the port of Palembang onto their ships. Uh, and then that will bring the numbers even further down in Palembang, uh, close to around 50,000 fuel uh, in the event of when he takes it. Uh, so that's good. Now, hopefully those tankers are able to get out of there safely without any Japanese air cover falling on them. The Japanese have landed at Kuatan, so presumably inside two to three turns, probably closer to three because there's quite a bit of damage to the runway there uh, at the earliest. Uh, in about three turns, maybe he would be able to bring air units in, um, but we're not really sure how realistic that is or not. We just know that he's landed at Kuatan, which has a very modern airfield at level four, uh, and so that's something we need to be uh, aware of. Uh, in addition, he is moving down the peninsula up here in the north, uh, presumably down on Kuala Lumpur and then also Malacca. Uh, we have ordered the troops at uh, Mersing to basically hightail it out of there. Last turn, they started moving while in combat formations, so they only made about six miles, which means if we were to keep moving them at the same pace, they'd get out of there in about eight days. I don't know if that's fast enough to get us out uh, in time to make sure they're not cut off uh, by his troops moving south in Johar Baru. Um, eight days is a lot of time. With no opposition between us and them, they certainly might make it out of there, uh, but they also might not. Uh, so we've ordered them to change over to move formation because he has shown no signs of attacking, uh, and they'll be falling back uh, in due course. Uh, there's one brigade, the 22nd Australian... They're making some progress in reforming themselves. Um, so they're going to be pulling out uh, as soon as possible with about 800 assault value there. Uh, but the other thing is we're not totally indefensible in our rear. Uh, there is a Indian brigade back there preventing the Japanese from just cutting them off completely. Um, in addition to that, what else is going on? The Japanese have moved an infantry unit here between Pegu and Rangoon, uh, which is cutting off uh, a couple of infantry battalions here. Uh, to the south at Molmon. Um, we could supply them via port, uh, by via sea, uh, so they're not necessarily totally cut off, but whatever. Um, I'm not going to move north because that would require a crossing river and a shock attack. I'm not going to move south from Pegu because that would likewise require a shock attack. We'll let two infantry battalions wither on the vine and die. It's okay. It's not the end of the world. Um, meanwhile, uh, we've brought in a bunch more British troops into Dumpur, uh, which has uh, several units here that are changing out of strategic formation into move formation, including the 18th Infantry uh, Division, which may move into Burma before too long. In China, well, this is a little bit of bad news. Um, not just a little bit, very bad news. Uh, and this is uh, concerning to uh, a serious degree. Um, as you remember, Lo Yang, the Japanese attacked here. We lost about 12,000 men. The Japanese lost about 6,000. We lost a fortification level, so it moved from level 3 fortifications down to level 2 fortifications. We have 45,000 infantry, 58,000 secondary troops here. This is about 100,000 Chinese soldiers at Lo Yang. This is the bulk, or at least about half, of our northern Chinese force, of our northern mobile Chinese force. Uh, about 500 guns, uh, a large number of Chinese infantry corps, and they are all now cut off. The Japanese have moved an infantry unit to our rear. Well, maybe not an infantry unit. They've moved an, a unit to our rear. The roadway here, which is where the Japanese came into Lo Yang from, actually moves behind to our rear. Now, we had forecast this, and we had troops with orders to move into that hex. Uh, all of the troops have orders to move into that hex now. 
but we had the 96th Chinese Infantry Corps and a few other units which had been ordered to move here a couple of days ago. They just haven't arrived in time. In addition to that, we've also issued order to the entire force at Luoyang to pull back, and we had actually made that decision last turn to say, you know, he had arrived about a turn ago in Luoyang, and we had made the decision to say, like, all right, we can't hold here. Fortification level three, it's a little bit dicey. Uh, it isn't good terrain. I'd rather hang out in the mountains. I alluded to that during the um, the replay portion of the turn is that it's something we'd been considering. And I had actually issued the order to fall back, but it wasn't given in time. So the Japanese now are in our rear. If they attack again, they won't destroy us most likely because there is one friendly hex here to the north at Chao Cho. Uh, but they would corral us into a position where we would have no escape. They would have Kaopeng, which is in Japanese control, and they would have Luoyang to our rear. Uh, this is mountainous terrain, but there's no source of supply here. There's no roadway for supply. And 100,000 soldiers in China cannot rely on no supply. So we are issuing orders for everybody to move as quickly as possible. I'm gambling that he won't attack again this turn. Uh, he did lose quite a few troops. He is not, he has not been pro he's been very aggressive, but XGRG has not been prone to launch continuous massive assaults day after day after day after day when he takes heavy casualties, especially heavy disruption like he did in the last turn. Like, yes, he reduced the fortification level, but he lost about one to one if you look at disabled and destroyed units together because disabled units cannot fight for all intents and purposes a disabled unit is destroyed for a few turns until it has a chance to regain its composure a destroyed unit is destroyed and won't come back but as far as today is concerned he lost almost 700 units destroyed or disabled which means that those units will not participate in any attack tomorrow or today uh, and so I'm gambling that the fact that he lost about six about 700, I lost just shy of 800, almost one-to-one -one casualties there, uh, and the fact that I've got defensive fortifications may make him less likely to attack, and so I'm trying to leverage next turn uh, in order to sprint as many of my troops into this hex as possible. Um, I don't know what this is. If this is an infantry division, we're screwed. We're not going to break out. If it's an SNLF force or maybe an armored unit, there's a chance we could break out. Uh, and my goal is obviously to take this, reopen the supplies to our troops at Luoyang, but not just reopen supplies, also open up a uh, avenue for escape. So um, because I, I want to retreat to Cyan. Cyan is where we produce supplies. Cyan has oil. It has fuel. Uh, it generates supply here because there's a refinery. So um, I want to get back to Cyan. Um, you know, generates 60 supply per turn. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the fuel oil there generates a little bit more supply every turn. Uh, and it's also, I think, isn't Cyan linked to one other base further north that generates supply? Maybe not. Um, but in any event... Um, it is a base that we can retreat on. Oh, wait, yeah, Lang Kao is up here, right? Lang Kao has oil and fuel as well. So it's closer to Cyan. It's closer to Lang Kao, and that's kind of the main uh, bastion in the north. So uh, I have other troops that are rushing towards Cyan as well. Uh, the extra troops in Yan'an, uh, the extra troops here north of Luoyang, so that we should have a pretty strong force in Cyan before he can get there. But again, uh, losing 100,000 troops in China would be nothing short of a disaster. Um, in addition to that, uh, we do have these tankers over here. Or this this uh, convoy here did refuel. The Yat Xing uh, did refuel at uh, Tarkin, and they are now sprinting. For Bataan, they're about three days away, I think, assuming they don't get intercepted first, uh, but we'll see if they can actually make it there. Uh, meanwhile, actually, these uh, we've got some uh, Dutch submarines, which are closing in on Kaigan. Uh, remember, Kaigan is a friendly base, so these uh, Japanese cruisers offshore at Kaigan uh, might actually be something that we can target and uh, hit with effective torpedoes out of these Dutch submarines. It would be great to be able to hit a sitting duck convoy uh, at uh, Kaigan. Um, in addition to that, uh, we also got some fuel out of Balak Papin. So you remember we sent three tankers into Balak Papin. Uh, two of them are coming out with fuel oil, about 10,000 fuel uh, coming out of Balak Papin on its way to Perth. We have a third tanker which is loading up and actually is completely loaded up and is also going to be on its way to Perth next turn. So that brings us to around 17,000 more fuel pulled out of Balak Papin and it's down to 29,000. What I forgot to do until this turn at Balak Papin was turn off the refineries. So we just turned off the refineries at Balak Papin, which means that the oil uh, 
stockpile should continue to grow there, uh, and the fuel oil or the fuel uh, should start to decline. Um, we also had some damaged ships from the carrier raid on uh, Kankau, or sorry, on Balakpapan, uh, which are going to try and make it out. Uh, they basically are battered to all hell, so we'll see if they actually make it anywhere. Um, these guys are ASW. They should move uh, toward enemy submarines, right? So we should we should do that. Um, so we should go try and intercept those guys. No retirement allowed. Remain on station. Um, and then we also have, I think we've got a couple of extra destroyers over here, don't we? We have eight light cruisers at Batavia. That's a lot of freaking light cruisers. And the one thing is the British light cruisers at least have a lot of torpedoes, kind of similar to the Japanese designs. They also have decent guns. They don't have uh, radar on some of these. Some of them do. The D class, but the uh, E class do not. They do. They don't get upgraded till forty three. They'll get radars in forty three, but not till then. So, um, all right. What was I saying? So those destroyers are heading out. Um, we've got another group. I think I said this of these guys loading up there. Um, we've got about thirty thousand fuel oil about to unload at Brisbane. Uh, from 3,000 tank three tankers, we've got two tankers unloading at Townsville, um, which is also, we should expand the port here, uh, we should also bring additional fuel into the Australian economy. So 20,000 coming into Townsville, 30,000 coming into Brisbane, that's another 50,000 fuel on the east coast of Australia to fuel the economy there. Meanwhile, our mine layers here are sprinting toward Comac to try and lay a minefield. Um, they also have three patrol gunboats going with them. Um, so they're going to be trying to lay a minefield at Comac. Um, we have not spotted his carrier battle group this turn. They've kind of disappeared, but we are still sprinting south. Our cruisers are over here. They are sprinting south uh, toward, uh, toward Auckland, toward New Zealand, uh, hopefully to get away. Um, and just because we know he had carriers in this area, we've diverted some of our convoys in the area. Um... I also didn't think it was necessarily wise to send a ton of fuel to Pago Pago. I was talking to Belugan, and he kind of said, listen, or not Pago Pago, Suva. He was kind of saying, listen, like, he's probably going to strike out at these other islands near Australia, uh, which we assume, right, along the Fiji line. And while we have a lot of troops here, if he really comes in hard, there's not a lot, apparently, that we can do as the allies to stop them, according to Belugan, who's more of an expert in this game than I am. So I don't want to leave him a ton of fuel with which he can... Uh, fuel and offensive, right? Like, Nomaya has no fuel. Okay, great. Comac has basically no fuel. Great. Um, Nadi has basically has no fuel and neither does Suva. So if either of those fall into his hands, that's great. There's no fuel. The problem is I have ships that are, like, sitting in port here that have no fuel either uh, that need to get out of there. And so my plan at this point, the Monterey is a really good ship. Let's hope he doesn't go after Comac because if he does, that's a fucking ocean liner. She's worth almost a heavy cruiser. Um... But in order to get my ships out of there, I need fuel oil. So I am bringing in the Gulf King, which is a tanker with about 10,000 fuel. It's going to unload at Suva. It'll be enough fuel to get all the ships in Suva, out of Suva. It'll be a little bit of extra if we need to make a port of call there at the front. But otherwise, it's not going to have a ton of fuel. Meanwhile, uh, this task force will fall back to uh, Pago Pago, which will be a little bit more of a, of a base of operations here. Uh, just because... You know, we've got some repair vessels. It's a little bit more out of the way. It's not as close to sort of the front at New Caledonia. Uh, and so I probably will build up a slightly larger reserve there. Um, my carriers are pulling back to uh, toward uh, Hawaii. So for whatever reason, we've got the Lexington and the Enterprise here, which kind of took a long uh, a roundabout way. For whatever reason, uh, Admiral uh, Spruance decided to go a little bit rogue and send the Saratoga straight home. Which is fine, she's there, but she's just going to beat everybody else to Pearl Harbor by several days. Meanwhile, the Yorktown is up north here. We're moving her a little bit closer. We're going to have our aircraft start pounding the airfields at Midway, which are decent at a level 4. Um, they had been hitting the port to see if there's anything there, uh, but um, yeah. Um, so the Yorktown is moving up there, and then we're finally in range for our battleships to sprint in, bombard with the escorts and the battleships uh, against Midway. 
and then after that they will fall back. So we'll see how that plays out next turn. Um, I don't like the fact that we've been bombing midway for two turns. It's given him time to respond. But the fact that the battleships will show up in the middle of the night means if he did move any aircraft in there, fair bet they're going to get smashed on the on the tarmac. Uh, at least that's the hope. Um, meanwhile, more convoy actions on the East Coast. Uh, I did finally start getting some ships at Cape Town, so we're actually starting to use some of these ships here. Um, some of these AKLs are still going to move to the eastern coast in the U.S. Some of these larger, better endurance transports are going to be again moving fuel from Cape Town to Australia. It's highly inefficient. If you can load fuel onto cargo ships, but they can only carry 50% of their cargo as fuel. So these guys, for example, can carry 4,100 cargo in their ship. Um, that means uh, 2,050 fuel. So what they can do is they can fill up with 2,050 fuel. They can take that fuel to Australia, but that's only going to be about 800 net. If they use up all their fuel, which they shouldn't use all of it, but it'll be close. If they use up all their fuel to get to Australia, that means they're only really transporting like 800 fuel for those guys. Meanwhile, these larger ones, 8,000, they're a little bit better off. They're going to be transporting about a net of 2,000, but it's just something to be aware of. It's not going to be transporting super efficient levels of fuel, but you know what? It's important to keep that fuel coming and we have 170,000 spare fuel at Cape Town right now so I'm going to start some of those operations. I'm also going to start putting a small amount of fuel into Diego Garcia and uh, we're going to build this port up a little bit to kind of be uh, a, a stopover point for some of our vessels. Um, doing the same thing with cargo ships out of Abaddon into Karachi to kind of help fuel the uh, Indian economy so that's good. Um, and that's about all I got this turn. Um, I apparently was sending a heavy anti-aircraft unit to uh, Batavia, but I decided against that. Like, what's the point in getting them cut off and destroyed? We'll redivert them to Port Moresby where they might have a chance to shoot down some aircraft. Um, so they're going to move along that way. Um, and then we've got the uh, Hurricanes that are getting close to arriving. They're still going to go into the Dutch East Indies. We'll probably not have them go into Singapore directly. Probably do drop them at Oosthaven, rail them to Palembang, and then fly them to Singapore. But that'll give us another 16 uh, fighter aircraft in Singapore. Meanwhile, we are unloading about 2,000 additional supply. Uh, the AK, the cargo ship Munlock, uh, has unloaded about 1,500 supply last turn. This has got about 2,600 more. Uh, we're up to 47,000 supply in Singapore, so we're slowly increasing our supply total there. Uh, and then the Blackhawk, the destroyer tender, has arrived back at uh, Palembang, and so she's going to load up with her 24, uh, 24 uh, 100 supply out of Palembang and uh, transport that over to Singapore. We might have to turn the refinery back on because the refinery is actually what generates supply in Palembang if we're going to keep trying to shuttle supplies into Singapore. Um, but at least if we do that, we should be much lower in terms of the amount of fuel at Palembang uh, so that we're not creating tons and tons of extra fuel for him if we can continue pulling that out through Oosthaven. Um yeah, I think that's the main stuff this turn. I did rearrange some submarines in Japan. Some of these guys are getting hit hard by escorts, so they're kind of moving to other positions off the eastern or sorry, western Japanese coast. Uh, I also am moving my submarines that are out of Tarawa. Uh, we're moving these guys uh, west uh, in an effort to into this area in an effort to intercept the heavy vessels that he had in the south. Unless he moves them to Espirito Santos, we're going to try and build a wall of subs, sort of a line of subs here. And then we're going to build another line of subs here, just south of truck, and then potentially a line of subs north of truck. So we're bringing subs in from sort of uh, Surabaya, where we have some Dutch submarines. They're going to make a stopover uh, at Ternate, where there's a little bit of extra fuel to replenish. Uh, those subs are going to go north of truck. And then two lines of American submarines south of truck uh, coming in from Tarawa and also coming in from uh, Wake Island and uh, from just uh, the Marshall Islands area, the Kwajalein submarines uh, north of Kwajalein, uh, in an effort to make sure that, assuming he pulls this battleship force back, there are some damaged ships there. Maybe we can get some torpedo strikes in against them. Uh, we should probably also move the cuttlefish away from truck where it's at right now because uh, there's enemy escorts all over her. So we'll move her south of truck as well. We've already got one sub there. Um, and maybe we'll get lucky with a Mark 14. Who knows? It's possible. 
Um, that being said, I think that's going to do it for this turn. There wasn't a lot going on in the air. You can see the Japanese lost six op planes. Uh, we lost one. Apparently, we lost 15 aircraft on the field. I'm guessing those were... Where were those? Where the hell were those 15 P-40Bs lost? It had to be at a base somewhere that we lost, right? Where did we lose those? Huh. Now I'm really curious. Where could I potentially... Did we lose any bases last turn? Uh, upgrade units, Pago. I'm so confused. Well, you know what it was? It's probably a cargo ship carrying them that was sunk, right? Let's take a look here. Uh, where would it be? Ship sunk, last turn. Chattanooga City. Near Cabra. Where the hell's Cabra? Uh, yeah, I'm so confused. I'm assuming it was something on the Chattanooga City. Where the hell was it again? Near Cabra 135-163. 135-163. All right, so 135 and then 163, right? So it's going to be way south. Oh, fuck. Fuck me, fuck. So it was, we had another squadron of P-40s. So we had two squadrons of P-40s that were on their way into Suva. That's where it was. Fuck. We still have 16 more that hopefully will make it in. But that's going to hurt. Mm. We have lost about 30 aircraft at sea so far in this war. You can see there are 15 destroyed. Fuck. Man, these Japanese submarines are killing us, you guys. They're killing us. And, I mean, those are aircraft that could have done something against him. Not not seriously, but could have, you know, um, they, could have, they could have potentially done something. What I'm curious about is if that, if those P-40s, like, do we get them? First off, let's top pilots. We didn't lose anyone killed according to the game. Uh, aircraft replacements, not the pool, that's not what I'm looking at. Uh, group reinforcement schedule. So do we, like, is it usually like 60 days from when you're destroyed, you get them back? Um, or is it 90? I don't know, I don't know if I get them back. Like, are they, if they're sunk at sea, are they destroyed for good? That's the other thing, is I don't... Does it show destroyed air groups? I don't think it does. Reinforcements, withdraw, replacement, top pilots, pilot replacements. I don't think it shows... I mean, in theory, it could show it here on ground units, but it doesn't. So, yeah. Meanwhile, um, do we want to reform any of these units? The 41st Australian Brigade. Uh, we can recall them. 
These guys cost 500 to recall. The 3rd Indian Corps. I mean, it's a good unit. They were killed near Kotobaru. Um, these guys only cost 12 political points to recall. Well, the 1st Australian Division. So they were destroyed... I wish I could, like, disband these guys. It's so ridiculous that we've got to deal with these, like, so the small contingent of troops. Like, I would have honestly rather this entire unit just go down. With the ship, because now I can't reform the uh, division. Can we send... I don't want to send anyone too valuable. Whoops. Are there any cheap AEs here? They're fast and they have a small payload, so... All right, verify load, accept. And then we're going to just sprint him into uh, Suva. Actually, it's naughty, isn't it? That's where all these guys are. You get big efficiency bonuses. So, whatever. We'll move them at normal speed for now, then we'll sprint them in a couple of days when they get closer. Um, and if they get sunk, they get sunk. Um, I think it's worth the cost of being able to form them into an actual division. Um, yeah. Because it's just a detachment. The rest of the unit, I think, uh, is ashore. Yeah. Oh, wait. These guys are at Auckland. Where are these guys? Oh, yeah. First Australian Infantry Brigade. The rest of them are already at, are already here. So the first brigade has a few minor elements that are still in us in New Zealand. Although I guess that's the battalion that's off map. They're destroyed, so maybe we can't rebuild them if they're destroyed. I'm not quite sure. Damn it! I don't know. In any event, we'll find out soon enough. Uh, that's enough of me rambling and not being sure about the game mechanics. Uh, we're going to go ahead and sign off here, guys. I hope you're enjoying the series. And then as a reminder, tomorrow we will be doing a Rule the Waves live stream at around 10 o'clock Central Standard Time. Uh, the game comes out Friday, so this will be really a first look at the game uh, and kind of seeing uh, what our thoughts are. Um, Rule the Waves 2, sequel to Rule the Waves 1. Uh, meanwhile, uh, this is going to conclude our War in the Pacific episode. Uh, this is turn January 11th, 1942 of our War in the Pacific Let's Play with XTRG. Until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.